So next, we're going to segment by sector. And we're going to go through the 10 sectors and their growth patterns. So here's what you will learn. You're going to learn the tool we use to group companies for comparison. You're going to learn the 11 sectors and what type of companies fall into each. You're going to understand the revenue growth of these 11 sectors. Now, an important point to remember is we don't want to compare apples to oranges. No, we don't want to do that. We want to compare apples to apples. The tool we use to compare companies is the GIX classification. It's an industry classification developed by S&P S &P Financial Services and MSCI. And GIX works well for the global financial community. I've been using this classification for a long, long time. Now, GIX brought consistency. GIX was developed in response to the global financial community's need for one complete, consistent set of global sectors and industry definitions. Again, this allows for apples to apples comparison. It's become the standard recognized by market participants worldwide. Now, there are other standards around the world. Uh, there's the, I think it's called SIC, the SIC codes in the US in particular, but GIX is a global one and it works in the financial world. GIX allows for meaningful comparison. It sets a foundation for the creation of replicable, custom tailored portfolios and enables meaningful comparisons of sectors and industries globally. Now, a lot of the times I'm looking at GIX to help me compare the fundamental performance of companies, but you can also use it to understand which companies are representing which sectors. So if you're an investor, let's say you're a professional investor and you say, I want to overweight the infotech sector, then GIX will provide you with a list of companies that fit within that sector. So again, this comes from Standard & Poor's Financial Services. So MSC, MSCI uses revenues to classify a business, right, for GIX. It identifies the principal business activity based on revenues revealed in annual reports and financial statements. It classifies a company into a sub-industry that represents business activities that generate the majority of the company's revenues. So it starts at the bottom of a triangle, you could say, with 158 sub-industries. Then it says each of those company, every company in the world fits into one of those sub-industries and then each one of those sub-industries fits into some industry. And then each one of those industries fits into an industry group. And finally, at the top of this pyramid is the 11 sectors. The 11 sectors are the largest classification. Now, what we can say about this is that we are going to focus on the top of this triangle. So all the companies we've looked at, 14,809 companies, all of them fit into one of the 11 sectors. Now, revenues are more useful than earnings when looking at companies and classifying them. So to classify companies, MSCI uses revenues rather than earnings. Unlike earnings, companies usually reveal information about geography or other sources of revenues. But in the financial statements of companies, they don't always reveal the earnings or the profits. Now, when classifying, revenues are more useful than earnings also. After determining a company's sub-industry at the bottom of the triangle, MSCI then assigns the company to an industry and then an industry group and finally a sector, which is at the top of that triangle. Now, earnings are used when a company is borderline. So, some companies have two or more business activities, none of which contribute 60% or more revenues. So earnings are considered when they're classifying this company to help identify the sub-industry that provides the majority of both. Now, there are such things as conglomerates and holding companies. So if a company is diversified across three or more sectors, none of which contributes more revenue or earnings, the company is classified in either what's called industrial conglomerates, which is part of the industrial sector, or is a multi-sector holdings, which is a sub-industry under the financial sector. So let's look at the sectors and the breakdowns here. Now, we call it, the classification is called GICs, but a lot of times we call it MSCI sectors. So here we have 11 sectors you can see from energy all the way down to real estate. 
And you can see some of the companies that are the big ones like consumer discretionary, Amazon. You can see consumer staples, Walmart. Healthcare, United Health. Uh, financials, JP Morgan. Those are some of the biggest companies in there. And each of those sectors has industry groups. Now we can see energy just says energy. The industry group is energy. Same thing with materials. But when we look at industrials, industrial companies could be capital goods. They could be commercial and professional services. They could be transportation. And if we look down at communication services down at the bottom, it could be telecommunication services. And that's like uh, mobile phone companies. And it could be media and entertainment. So here are some of the companies that fit into those classifications. So you can see, for instance, transportation, there's a railroad company called Union Pacific. And under automobiles, we can see to Toyota. There's McDonald's under consumer services, under consumer discretionary. Nestle is food and beverage. So you can get an idea of how they're breaking it from sector down into industry group. Let's just take the industrial sector, which code is 20. And there you can see the code 2010202020030. Those are how the classifications are done. Let's just take the industrial sector and you can see it's capital goods, commercial services, and you can see transportation. And then the industry, well, under capital goods, it could be aerospace, it could be construction, it could be trading companies, commercial and professional services, it could be supplies, it could be professional services, and transportation could be anything from air freight or airlines to railroads. And we can see the breakdown in further detail in the sub-industry. Sub-industry would be the bottom of the triangle, where we can see, for instance, if we look at the machinery so industrial, capital goods, machinery, we can see construction machinery, agriculture machinery, and industrial machinery. Now let's go through some of these just so you understand them. The first one is consumer discretionary sector, and that's when a company makes or sells products and services that are sensitive to the economic cycle, right? There are items that a company, that a person or a consumer could delay. And this has the second highest number of companies represented in our global stock markets. The next one is consumer staples, where we see the sale of products that are less sensitive to economic cycle. When we think about staples, we're not talking about the stapler. What we're talking about is staple foods, things let, that we need on a consistent basis, home supplies. So products we consume regularly, food, beverages, tobacco. Huh? Yeah, there's some old um, classifications. I didn't even know people smoked anymore. So let's now look at the global revenue growth. We looked at this chart before, but I'm going to uh, look at it in a little bit more detail. And what I'm going to do first is I'm going to widen the y-axis. You can see I'm going to go back one slide, and you're going to see it was from positive 20 to minus 20. But now I'm going to increase it from positive 50 to minus 50. And then we're going to get rid of those lines, delete the minimum, maximum, and average lines. And then I'm going to plot the consumer discretionary and consumer staples uh, revenue growth right on there. So the global line didn't change. So we can see the behavior. Now consumer staple and consumer discretionary move pretty much in line with the overall market. But one thing you can see is that in 2009 and in 2008, the consumer discretionary sector collapsed a lot more than the consumer staples. And that makes sense. People are going to postpone the purchase of a discretionary item like a TV or something like that. Now, energy sector derives revenue from oil and gas exploration, refining, storage, things like that. Financials, are companies in this sector generate their revenue from banking, thrifts, mortgages, finance, asset management companies. Now, if you notice on the right, I see the financial statements of this sector are so dramatically different than others that I refer to the other 10 sectors as corporates or non-financial companies. And this sector, of course, is financials. Now, valuing financials actually is a much more advanced topic and, and understanding the financials uh, sector. So we're going to leave it out of this analysis. So the next is healthcare. So we can see these are companies that generate revenue from providing healthcare services. 
and the manufacture and distribution of equipment or technology. So now we can look at the revenue of energy and healthcare. And here we can see that the energy sector is swinging about quite dramatically. Healthcare actually is very stable. Look at the 2009 period where you can see it hardly fell because no matter what's happening with the economy, people end up spending on their health. So why does the revenue growth swing so wildly with energy? This is the most volatile sector of all. Well, energy prices are number one and they can swing dramatically. But what causes energy prices to swing dramatically? Well, this is a capital intensive business. It could be five years before the beginning of construction until they're able to complete construction on some of their exploration and drilling and refineries. And usually by that time we get into oversupply, share prices may then, or the price of oil may start to collapse. Also we have, of course, geopolitical and other items. Now industrial sectors has a lot in it, but let's just review a little bit. It, one part of the industrial sectors provide commercial and professional services. And the other one provides transportation services. And here we have information technology. This sector has the third highest number of companies represented in global stock markets. And it generates revenue from software and information technology. And it's also hardware. So sometimes people think, well, Facebook as an example may be in there. But the fact is, there's also semiconductor makers in there. So this sector, as I say, has the third highest number of companies represented. So now, Let's look at industrials versus inter infotech. Now, they're moving almost in lockstep with the overall global average. Well, part of that's because industrials has the largest number of companies in it, so it tends to move in line with the global average. Now, you also see something very fascinating, and that is the revenue growth of the infotech sector is in line. I thought we have an infotech sector boom going on right now. Well, it's not showing in these revenue growth numbers. Now, keep your eye out over the next couple of uh, sections, and you may see that I'll revisit this point. Now, let's look at materials and real estate. Materials manufactures chemicals, construction materials, and the like. Real estate generates revenue from real estate development. And also, there's something called real estate investment trusts, or REITs. And here we can see that the real estate market has been actually booming quite a bit for our universe. Why is that? Well, part of the reason for that is because China is heavily represented in our universe and China's been going through a real estate boom. What about the communication sector? Well, it generates revenue from the facilitation of communication and related content and includes telecom and media and entertainment companies also. There's the utilities sector, which generates revenue by producing electricity, gas, and water. And it includes independent power producers, traders, generation and distribution of electricity. And here we can see that the revenue growth is kind of in line with the global average. Nothing major. You could say that the telecoms has been pretty flat, uh, less volatile than the global average and the utilities. So finally, here's a summary of all of the sectors, excluding the uh, financials and real estate. So what you'll see here is the real estate sector is actually in the table, but when I talk about the global average, at the bottom left, you'll see an asterisk, and then you'll see a note below. It says excluding financials and real estate sector. You'll learn more about that later and why we do that. So what you have learned? Well, the 11 sectors in the GIC classification systems, you learned about consumer discretionary, staples, energy, financials, all the way down to utilities. Now you also see that I put communication services in parentheses. Actually, it used to be called telecoms and now it's becoming the communication services. So I think I, next time I need to change it so that telecoms is in the parentheses. So fastest growing sector over the past two decades was real estate. The second was energy. The slowest were industrial and utilities. Most volatile was energy, second, and with half the volatility was materials. You see, energy and materials are both driven by oil price and they're very capital intensive, so they tend to be volatile. And the least volatile was consumer staples, followed closely by healthcare. All right, you did it. You made it to the end of this section. So what's next? Well, in the next section, you're going to get to know 10 leading companies, one from each of these 10 sectors.
I'll see you there. I, I joined the Valuation Masterclass Bootcamp um, because I would like to get better at valuing companies. I, I, I mean, I'm, I not only want to become an analyst, but also I invest my own money. And actually, I'm investing my parents' money also. So I got to know how to do all of this so that I don't mess up with their money. Um, I think the most important part that I learned really is the valuation mistakes. I look back on my other models now uh, that I made before. I committed a lot of them. So I'm really happy I've learned that. <laughs> and actually learning to be more efficient. Because uh, I remember during one of the consultations with you, you were saying that you're more, more efficient than everyone else because you were doing a uniform model for every company, right? And mm. by experience, I've been building uh, individual models for different companies. It takes a lot of time. And I learned the lesson of being efficient. But if I had to build from scratch, it might have taken me like two to three weeks, right? 